We are on. Thank you for coming right back. Play is, we're not going to review play real quick and then go more into that. Play is, and you can look at your notes or whatever, or Google the mind. Come on, play is, we're going to give that totally non-parsimonious definition of play. It's intrinsically, right? Built into the bioplasm of the being. Intrinsically motivated. Right? Play is an intrinsically motivated activity, language. What else can you tell me about play? Boy, you jumped way over like down here. That's so cool. That's way later, but yes. Ultimately, play is the way the child connects with self, other, in the world. You betcha. But in giving that definition, you already have the definition, right? I think you wrote it. Not there somewhere. Somebody pull up the definition there? You see it from last week? I mean, I, can, I have it here, but I'd like you to do it if you can. Intrinsically motivated language, activity and language. Embedded in the developmental stage. Thank you. Embedded in the developmental stage by which. Right. What, what do they manipulate and express and explore? Right. Very good. Experiences, right? Their conceptions, their perceptions, their thoughts, feelings, ways of the, the concerns that are important to them. What else? With the possibility of resolving and expanding his or her way of managing and assimilating such issues as well as developing and learning, practicing and mastering new perceptions and concepts in a context that is in a context that is understood to be make believe. Absolutely. And the latter is so all of that's important, but the latter is very important. They understand it's make believe. We're never supposed to diagnose kids borderline, but there are kids that seem to have at a neurobiological basis a lot of those quote traits. And one of the uh, one of the ways that's exemplified is they lose boundary between what's make-believe and what isn't. And in my STEM world, one of the little figures I have is a plastic spider. It's kind of real looking. And some kids will go, whoa! And I'll take the spider and go, I know it looks real, but it really isn't. See, you can put it on my nose, it's not real. They go, oh, okay. And most kids, that's the end of it. With borderline S type of kids, they keep losing that boundary again and go, whoa! Context is understood to be make-believe. I saw, hope, did you get all the articles? I sent you a bunch of articles. I mean, you read every one of them. One of them was about trans species play. We're not the only species that plays. Even fish play. Birds play. All kinds of creatures. I told you about, yes, wasps even play. Very good, you read it. Doesn't make you a better human being, but I'm glad you, you know, a better student, whatever. I told you about blackjack and pancake. They play fight. They knew, and then a real fight. They knew the difference very clearly. Chimps, when they f are mad and they fight, one of them then will go into the field and pretend that they found something interesting and call the group and the only one that will come will be the one that they're mad at. And then they will play, pretend that they're finding something and then they'll shake hands. Isn't that cool? Makeup. Come on. Hug. Okay. It is the psycho, neuro, endo, socio, biological, and anything else you want to add. Scaffolding of human competence. You watch a kid immersed in play, and they are immersed. And when you were a pumpkin, you're immersed. And you, I always imagine if you have an fMRI, you are watching all kinds of myelinations, all kinds of areas of the brain connected. <coughs> First of all, as I told you, the reason you're attending is because you played. It caught you. You got interested. How? What? I'm the producer. It caught you how to be focused and attentive. That dopamine pulled you into that. By definition, it's abstract, right? As long as you know it's a context that's make believe, you're practicing abstract reasoning. It's not really a. This isn't. This isn't really a person. This isn't really a horse. You're playing at that. It's an abstraction. And furthermore, and this is what I love, it is a representation of an aspect of yourself. Every single thing. This is an aspect of self. This is an aspect of self. This is an aspect of self. You have the luxury, pleasure, and privilege 
of getting to immerse yourself with this child in a 3D representation of their beingness. How cool is that? And that's what I mean by manipulating. They're working at this and they get to experiment. Brave horse flying, landing. They get to experiment with stuff they can never do in the real world. But they're setting up schemas about self. And I do have Batman and Superman. And there's no mystery as to why it is they love those figures. Those are aspects of self, empowerments. That's that developing aspects that aren't there yet, reaching towards. Let's, let's open up a window about development really quickly. Right? Embedded in a, in a developmental phase. So roughly, let's call it zero to two-ish. There's a lot of motor play. Right? They, it drives parents crazy. When you'll, you'll see when your little pumpkin is six or eight months, whatever, and they'll start doing apprehension, they'll let go. Because to wire the brain to let go is post-wiring to grab. We first already know how to grab. We have to train ourselves. We have to do all that myelination to learn how to let go. So you'll take them to the restaurant or wherever it is, you give them something and they drop it. And then of course the delight in the fact you go, oh, and you go over and you pick it up and you give it back to them. Now this, this is really interesting. Now we have a social engagement here and I have control over you. Oh, I'm loving this. I'm also practicing this. It's practicing. So it's a lot of its motor. And then of course the two to five-ish, again, or six or whatever, is the classic magic mind, metaphoric mind, or before the low, what all we've been talking about and focusing on. Remember I also said one way to look at development is what we're connected to. And your little pumpkin, first of all, all her uh, sensories are one. Hearing, seeing, feeling, it's not differentiated yet. It will be over the next couple of months. But her attachment, her connection, her whole world is you and your partner. And then this kind of other stuff. But they'll start in the little blinking, the binking, and all that stuff. It'll get connected, connected, connected. In many ways, the two to five year old, in many ways, one of their primary connections is to the magic mind. It's a kind of, they're connected to that. And God knows I'll be connected to the little figure. I remember a little white horse that I had. I swear to God, I'm on the ground. I feel like I'm in the plains in New Mexico and I'm a Native American. That's how it felt. It's as real as it could possibly be for me. Because one of the things that play tells you, it gives you the realization that the real is right here. That's what's real is what's in there. And you kind of, wow, okay, so magic mind. Then you get around six, seven, whatever, somewhere around there, till about 10, 12, whatever, becomes very rule bound. Now notice, this is, good old Piaget, accommodative, accommodation. You're accommodating to the world, you're learning about the world, grabbing, ungrabbing, all this. This is, metaphoric mind, very assimilative. You are defining how the world is while learning about it. Now you're back to being rule bound, very accommodative. Remember that? You're cheating! There are these set rules. Even in the magic mind part, you set up rules. McGoldrick, my best buddy, whose birthday is on November 3rd, it'll become relevant, trust me. We play army. Yeah, with well, the guns and the protein guns and whatnot. But we had all kinds of rules about how you play it and whatnot. So even though it's magic mind, we're now, that instead of using the logic, we're the objects. When you see the wonderful filial therapy tape, again, he's 8, 10-ish, he'll use his dad and he as the play objects. They're playing roles. But there's all kinds of rules that get set up. Okay? Sports become really big here, right? Oh my God, I never could keep track of the rules in soccer. The whole thing about when it's offsides, I never quite got that. But look how elaborate all those rules are. You're acculturating when we get to latency. So you're attached to different things here. Okay. It is the context by which you create the narrative of the self. Remember, we are storytelling people. That's how the child tells the story of who they are and evolves the story of who they are is through play. Do you know that? If you ask the average five-year-old to stand still and don't move, do you know how long they generally last? About? Take a guess, not a big deal. It's actually, generally three, about three minutes. And then they're like, mm -hmm. longer than you thought, pretty good. So they're not, what, ADD, whatever. <laughs> I told you about ADD and dopamine, right? It's not attention, it's an interest disorder. 
It's how you stay interested because of lack of dopamine. Now you tell them they are the guard at Buckingham Palace. How long do you think they can stand totally still, barely blinking their eyes? How much longer? How many minutes on average? Eight, right between seven. Seven minutes, more than twice as long if you just simply tell them they are now the guard at Buckingham Palace. <laughs> I told you about booga booga chugga chew, the motorcycle protection force. It's here to protect you. For Duran, right? Remember I told you when he was motorcycle phobic? That's play. That's the use of totally reframing something through play because play is the antithesis of amygdalation. When you're playing, you're not amygdalated. You're not in the amygdala. You're in your fun zone. You're in your open creative zone. In fact, you have much less dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. You have much more imaginative, global stuff. Now, there are times, by the way, again, when you're amygdalated, you're also in a very global area. That's not useful. That's when you want the prefrontal cortex. Remember I told you how you know somebody's amygdalated? They use words like, you never listen. You always, they do these very global. And the PF the PFC is very specific right now at this point in time, you both. But the flip side of that, play has this amazing creativity because it does let go. It's like dream states. You let go of a lot of the dorsolateral and these rules and try something new, outside the box thinking and whatnot. Okay. So I told you about that paranoid schizophrenic guy that would be afraid of the FBI or something. And I'd open the door and say, go away and close it. And he would laugh. Or I'd suddenly grab something off his shoulder and go, I got it. And he would laugh. And that's his sanest part. That's the observing part that goes, this is nuts. That's funny. I'm crazy, baby. OK? Did I tell you how I conquered my fear of ski lifts? Did I tell you this? Very quickly. I'll do anything for my son. I don't want to ski. I have no interest in skiing. And I really resent if I'm going to hurt myself and I can't surf and do karate because of skiing. My wife's a skier, she grew up back east. My son's a skier, snowboarder, blah, blah, blah. Our friends are, so off we go into the mountains. Hmm, okay, okay. My kid's six. Daddy, you gotta come up to the mountain and ski. Well, I can't be a wuss and a wimp for my kid. Okay, I am terrible. I, I, I don't mind being in a building. It can be a thousand feet, I don't care. As long as I'm in an enclosure. Ski lifts are not enclosed. You're hovering up there. Oh my God. You're 30, 40 feet, and then, oh, oh, and then there's that canyon, and all of a sudden you're like, holy schnoly, you're like 80 feet in there, and guess what? That's exactly the spot that all of a sudden, oh, it stops now. <laughs> oh, that's great. God, I'm getting sweaty. It's so funny, I'm getting, just, just thinking about this. And then what happens? Oh, yes, that little gust of breeze starts happening. Oh, my God, you're stuck. You're going like this back and forth. You're 80 feet off the ground. I was like, oh, God. <sighs> it's anti-Zen. I don't want to be here now. And he used to go to those ski instructors. I'd say, just talk to me. Just talk to me the whole time. Distract me. Let me tell you about surfing. Let me tell you anything. With my wife, it's like, let's talk about other things. You know, anything, sex. I don't care. Anything. Get my mind off of this. The worst moment, actually, it's funny. I was with my sister-in-law, who's even more scared than I am. And we were stuck. And it was that thing. I said, tell me about the birth of your first child. <laughs> we're going to get through this. Oh, it's crazy. I know how many posts there are before you finally get off. Fuck, I got eight more posts to go. I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> Shit, this is crazy. Oh my God. I never forget. I'll talk about blindly in the line, because of course it's bunny slope stuff. Pizza, French fries. Pizza, French fries. I got much better, but oh my God. So now I'm in line. I'm the only big adult in line on the little bunny slope. And there's all these little kids, the little pumpkins, and the little reindeer class, or whatever it is. You right? So they go, sir, would you take, you know, be with this kid up? Oh, my God, I'm going to go on the ski lift with this little kid, and I'm going to be attentive to this little kid. Oh, this thing has to be down all the time, and I've got to hang on to it like this. I mean, the ski instructor will say, it's time to let go. No! Well, the little kid is, she looks at me, I'll never forget this. She says, will you take my gloves off? Oh, God! Now I have to let go of the bar. I have to turn, and I, oh, and I have to help her. She didn't even want the bar down. I insisted on the bar down. You get the picture. I mean, it's pathetic. It's unbelievable. Daddy, will you come up? Okay. I got to get over this. Well, fortunately, we were in North Star. 
North Star has a gondola, enclosed gondola, that goes to the big lifts that goes to the top of the hill. It's about 10 o'clock. Everybody's already on the mountain. Nobody's around. I get in this gondola. Implosive therapy. I'm going to make this happen. I'm going to do this. I get to the edge of the... Again, it's enclosed. I'm fine. I make myself look down. And I know this sounds crazy, but I say the following. I am a hawk. Height is beautiful. Oh, I am a hawk. Height is beautiful. Oh, oh. oh I totally move into hawkdom. I am a hawk. I'm surprised I couldn't fly, man. I was, I was, now there's nobody around. I went up, came back down. I did that three times. So I don't know, probably 90 times, probably 30 times a time or more, whatever. <coughs> I'm a hawk, it's beautiful, I'm a hawk. I, I went right out, went right to the big lift. Yeah, I put the thing down, I said, I am a hawk. Height is beautiful, bring it on! Oh! Thank God there was nobody sitting next to me, thank <laughs> God. I went right up to the top, right up to the top. Got off, met everybody for lunch. They're like, whoa, I can't believe it. everybody's high five. I can't believe you're up here. I'm a hawk, height is beautiful. <laughs> Oh shit, how do I get down the mountain? <laughs> yeah, that was a problem. I have no pride. I take my skis off, I walk. I have no pride. I used to walk up sometimes. My wife's like, I can't believe you're walking. I'm not taking that lift. Ever since then, I swear to God, I'm so much better. I don't count posts anymore. I still like the bar down. And I still wait till the very end. Everybody's like, no, not yet. Okay, now. I'm so much Play. Play. The playful mind. I keep telling you, it's the cure to cancer, it's the cure to the Middle East. Play. Let me give you a very, very dramatic one. So I'm at St. George Homes. And we had this, and I'm the head resident of the home. I'm running this one particular home. We had seven homes around the, the uh, Berkeley UC campus. She was 17, very large, African American, marvelously creative. She would write the words, I would do the music, we wrote songs together. I'm the head resident of the home she's in. She was by far the most violent, dangerous kid we ever had. She would come up to a person and ah, bite their cheeks. We were all known at Herrick Hospital because we go in for tetanus shots for human bites. We had two major encounters. One, we were, we, in the summer we went into Northern California and lived the life of the Plains Indians. Again, it's a very union base. Native Americans, Jungian based place. So she wanted a power object that was this rock that looked like a tomahawk. And I, given everything else, let her have it. She brought it back to Berkeley. She made an altar, blah, blah, blah. This isn't the main story I want to tell you, so I'm going to go fast on that. She ended up at one moment when she got in that altered state, she'd always start as if she's drunk, <laughs> and her pupils go, and then she'd get rageful. I was her and me alone, and she threw me on the bed, and she took that rock, and she was going to kill me, kill me. And everything does go slow motion. And I had this fantasy of, oh, I'm in the Berkeley Times. Counselor dies. It wasn't on page one. I'm not narcissistic that way. It was kind of more like page three or something. In Berkeley, born Israel, died. But this is where I ended up. How weird is that? I mean, all these thoughts are flying through your head. And then I think, let's see, if I do this, I'll break my arms, but maybe I'll save my hip. Oh, well, yay for Steve Haskell. He came into the room. He looks. She looks at him. And then she throws the thing, and I move, and there's a huge hole right where my face had been. Okay, fast forward. She again has run away from the youth center where, where the schooling was. She's now home. I'm, I don't know, I go chasing after. She's in the kitchen. <laughs> She's about to set fire to the curtains in the kitchen. She's got matches. I come in. She's huge. And when they're in the altered state, you know, they, they all say the woman can lift up the Volkswagen. She can lift up a Mack truck. She's, in, She's big and strong. She's totally altered. And she looks at me. She has the matches. She's about to set fire. And I have no idea what to do. But I happened to be right next to the fridge. And I looked at her and said, just, w just wait a sec. Just, just one sec. And I opened the fridge and I go, okay, hang on. Just hang on. Just, now I'm up, she's right here. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, go! Bam! Bam! I started throwing eggs at her. She looks at me, she's like, oh, this is much more fun than setting fire. Wham! And we have this enormous, fantastic egg fight. 
And eggs are just splattered all over them. We're just splattering and we're laughing. It is crazy. Laughing, laughing, laughing. And our hair's on. Then we ended up shampooing each other's hair. And well, it's good protein. Well, okay? In desperation, turn to play. Totally changed the brain state. Totally changed the brain state into play. Save my life. Save my the house or whatever. If you can do that. Okay, get the sense of this? Okay. You know, I don't know. I'd be very surprised if she's still alive. I'd be very surprised. I'm sure she went into some prison. So, I mean, you know, you can't cure everybody. There's obviously neurobiological, all kinds of stuff that goes on. It's sad, actually, that way, because she was so creative. Okay. By the way, another just when I was a kid, this is not near as dramatic. So I'm coming over from Israel. I'm on a boat. They had planes, but we used a boat. And it happened that we passed this beautiful ship. I'll never forget it. It was late afternoon. You could see it through the porthole, named the Andrea Doria. And I found out two days later that that boat sank. Whoa! Wait a minute. I'm on a boat. You mean these things sank? Holy schnollin! I spent days doing nothing but like cartoon drawings of the Andrea Doria sinking in great detail. Boat, a little, little less, and then gone. Do it over, do it over, do it over, do it over. Remember I said patience? Well, part of the patience is they're going to keep doing the same thing over, 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 and over, and over, and over, and over, and over, and over. How many times is Bambi going to get eaten by Godzilla? If you're a purist humanist, as long as you want to. If you want to do the next 50 years of Bambi being eaten by Godzilla, that's what we're going to do. I'm good for about five. And then I, we actually had Bambi. It was actually T-Rex. You've seen the 30-second Bambi meets Godzilla. Anyway, oh, God. La, 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 the little Bambi. And then the top hand of the screen, you see the shadow. Bam! Big Godzilla's foot. There's Bambi. Anyway, I lost my train of thought. Choo, choo, come back. Because I got... You can do it five times. Five times. Thank you for tracking. <laughs> so the Bambi Godzilla thing, I then put in Superman. I said, I'm wondering if something might save Bambi. In comes Superman. I will save you, Bambi. And what did he do? Took Superman and literally threw him across the room. Fair enough. <laughs> you will see next week in the Carl tape, there's a scene where you keep saying nobody's home. You'll, you'll see it's very poignant. It's really the theme for that. If I was going to call the tape, never mind the Manson tape, I would call it no one's home. There's one point you'll hear me say, I'm home, Carl. Or something like, hi, Carl, I'm home. That's counter-transference. That's because I felt some pain, so I wanted to change that for him. He immediately says, nobody's home. I go, no one's home. I learn quickly. Gotcha. By the way, one other trait that's useful, that's very difficult for you kids, if you're going to be a therapist, get a life. Separate from these kids. I told somebody to say, this is better than Disneyland. I love you. It's very gratifying. If you're overwhelmed with all your stuff and not getting a lot of juice in, it is so gratifying to have the little pumpkins love you so much and want to be with you so much. My remedy is get a golden retriever puppy. They will love, adore, and treasure you. Never mind eat your shoes. Fill full. Okay. Okay, play. I think you get the sense of how important play is and what a misnomer is because what is it really? The child immersed in... Come on, come on, come on. The child immersed in self-creation. At the neurobiological, psychosocial, and ecological, any other way you want to look at. That's what play is. It's a total misnomer. That's why it's so important. You are a co-writer of the narrative of the child's soul. Because when you play with them, you are co-writing that. Wow, what a pleasure. What a privilege. What an honor. You're writing this poem of beingness with these little pumpkins. Helping create that. Let's talk about humanism. Oh, time. Stand still. Humanistic. Now, why did they get to call it humanistic? What, the rest are non-humanists? Atavists? But somehow they glomped onto humanistic. Let's look at the theory. All our theories we're going to take through this little grid here. 
Every theory has a theory of the person. You all have a theory of the person. Whether we're good, we're bad, we're neither, we're both, we're just neutral. Every theory has a theory of the person. Every theory has a theory of why there's pathology. Every theory has a theory of healing and the role of the therapist. And for every theory, there's going to be things you like and things you think aren't so hot. Now, again, this is going to be like a haiku. It's very cursory, but I want to at least have some common language, common concepts to look at humanism. What you, what you needing? You're needing some. Second one? Second one is what's the theory of pathology? Right? If you're, you're going to remember the three legitimate uses of therapy, one of them is to heal pathology. The other is like a pool filter, pool cleaner, kind of like a um, garbage disposal, toilet bowl. And the third one, you're like a musician. You're like a music teacher. You're a vitamin supplement. Those are all legitimate uses of the space. What do you understand is the theory? What motivates our beingness, according to Rogers, Maslow, all those folk? What's it all about, Alfie? You betcha. Be all that you can be. Self-actualization. I know the army in one of those <laughs> took it. I know. I know, it's probably trademarked. But they should have trademarked it first and the army wouldn't be able to use it. Be all that you can be. Do you know the other? I mean, what else? It's okay if you know. That's a lot. Okay, what are you meaning by that? I like that. Um, well, beyond, beyond self actualization, kind of transcending beyond the individual person and being more connected as a whole. Correct, to the universe at large. I mean, you do that when you're in a self actualized moment. You're in, that, you're in what I would call unimonic. When you're in a unimonic moment, you're really connected to the mind, body, spirit. You're connected to the whole universe. You feel at one with everything. It's cosmic, and you don't even need acid to get there. <laughs> How cool is that? That's mnemonic. So there's a guy named Robert White. First of all, you've got to understand. You've got to understand. Carl Rogers. <laughs> when we get to Siggy, he was, he was so brave. And we'll talk about him when we get to him. But so is Carl. Because the zeitgeist is all about psychoanalytic. That's really the only legitimate model of the human psyche at that point. And in certain ways, it became more and more rigid and all kinds of things. As you know, Freud was, he went on vacation with his clients, or patients, as he would call it. I mean, was, he was, had, was very open in certain ways. He got more and more rigidified. So here comes this guy that says, you know, I don't think it's just about sex and aggression. He didn't use so much the word connection, but that's really what he's talking about. I think it's about connecting. I think, I think we have much higher aspirations. So there's a guy named Robert White. Actually, let me back it up once. I, there's a, let me back up, and then we'll get to Robert. So there's a guy named, um, there's a guy at Michigan State, Joe Ryer, very smart man, very analytic. He wants to get done quickly, go to Joe, he's got a thousand ideas for a dissertation, the only problem is you got to do it exactly as he wants you to do it. You're just kind of like his assistant to get that piece done, but to get out quickly. Joe was very much a psychoanalyst. Joe was a handsome looking guy with a silver Porsche. He married three of his former patients, who happened to also be former students. Huh? But that aside, and look at the ooh factor. God, what a great ooh factor face. Ew, cooties and then some. That was a really good face. In those days, I guess you could get, I don't know. Get, anyway, whatever. So Joe did have, he talked to, I remember taking his class. He had a client that, as a matter of fact, climbed this big mountain that, to get to the top in the snow. What do you think was Joe Ryer's interpretation of that to that client? What was that client really motivated by? I'm not saying Joe was right. I mean wrong. I'm not saying he's wrong. All theories are also right. What was Joe's interpretation of why that client wanted to climb that mountain? Be psychoanalytic. Be primary process. What are you thinking? What does the mountain represent and the snow represent? Parents. What it, what it, I'm sorry, what? Ah, yes. If I did a bimodal distribution, would that help? Maybe the snow would be cold mother. Exactly. This is the breast. This is the cold milk. And this guy's trying to go up his mom's boob to get finally melt that ice and get the warm milk. Okay. I, I, that's probably, it's, again, if you have 12,500 associations per second, 
your mind is going back and forth. Okay, that might be one of them. I could, I could get that. Whatever. So that's the zeitgeist. And Robert White is writing his article. And he goes, you know, I think we're also driven by other things. I think there's a competence motivation. And it's not because, wow, I'm really loving this. Oh, I missed it. You see your mirror neurons? You were really stoked with me. And I was like, ow. That was huge. And Robert White said, you know, we're also motivated by competence and mastery. Because it really feels good to use what we got and be accomplished at it. it and, and we challenge ourselves. So it's good at one phase and it's good at the next. And every time I catch this, some dopamine goes, woo, this is cool. And you hang on with little, a little, uh, never mind two you rolls and their desire to be able to walk and do what you're doing. Imitation, connection with you and do that. But when you get to six and eight and they're doing that sport thing and all that stuff, oh my God, they just can't get enough of being competent. And what more better representation of competent self than Batman and Superman? Those dudes can fly, climb on buildings. Oh my God, how cool is that? Never forget, I might have already told you this. So Duran's on this soccer team. They play all weekend this tournament. We then go for lunch to two and a half days. And it's now time to wait for our table. And that restaurant happened to have this big couch-like thing for people to sit. What do these kids do? They create a game right away as to who could slide down the couch and basically vault themselves off farther. Competence and mastery. Now, you know what I think is the most primal drive of all, of course. So I actually believe underneath that is also, if I'm competent and masterful, people will feel positive towards me. Ergo, I'll feel connected to others. So I think that's still also a component, but there's also just the joy of being able to do what we can do. Contentment is talent plus effort. They create something, uh, sing more, and it gets recognized. Okay? So there's also competence and mastery. For those of you who've read Stalik, he talks a lot about this because when you're feeling psychologically safe, valued, and validated, that's the motivation that really gets triggered, not compensatory to feelings of inadequacy. So, which brings us right to what is pathology in this model? Why do we have, you know, if we're striving to be all we can be and we like to want to be competent, and why is there people who are misery and all that? When, when you're not getting your basic needs met, then you're not able to get to that level. Correct. That's fine. You were going to say something? You fall short on your expectation. When you what? Fall short of expectation. And particularly when you fall short of the people who are important to you, your interpretation of their expectations. Right? What? Is, what? What? Well, let's go to here and then we'll come back to here. What heals in this model? What's the universal? UPR. Unconditional. Positive regard. Actually, I put a G. Genuine. Unconditional. Positive regard. So what creates pathology that you didn't have? Un the lack of unconditional positive regard. When you aren't valued and validated, when you aren't reflexively reflected upon, you start to go on that yum-yuck continuum, remember I talked about? You start going, yuck, ooh, that part of me that wants to kill my little brother is yucky. Ergo, I'm yucky. Ergo, disavowed self. Aspects of self that we now have to disavow. No, the not me. That's not me. Woody Allen had a wonderful movie. I think it was like Stra Strawberry Memories. I can't remember what it was. Starlight Memories, Stardust Memories, something. Black and white. He's in the jungle hunting his anger. He's got the safari cap, that whole thing. And the anger, of course, is a big gorilla. So genuine, unconditional, positive regard. It's got to be genuine. It's got to be real. It's got to have the twinkle in the eye. It's got to be pheromonal. You can't fake it. Because other, when you don't get that, you're going to go, I'm yucky inside, some part of me, these feelings. And that's going to go in the orbital frontal lobe, not well accessible to prefrontal cortex. One of the marvels of play is, guess where it goes to? Orbital frontal lobe. You get to make a difference in how this kid sees himself in the template of the soul way over here. You don't just tell them, you're a very smart kid. You also show them in how they are in that world. 
and that you value them. Okay, unconditional positive regard, genuinely, is what heals. You now own, re-own, re-own the disavowed self. And you are free, free. Thank God, hallelujah, free at last. From all these, that's the re-own the disavowed self. Well, the way you do it with kids is through the play. You can think, feel, say anything, really anything. And that's okay. It's a valid and valuable human experience. It's okay you want to kill your brother. I get it. I get it. Why wouldn't you want to kill your brother? Pain in the ass. You had all that attention from mommy and daddy. This little sniper comes in. Oh, and you looked at mommy's looking at him. And that's how you remember. Remember Kuala Lu? Remember that book I read you the very first time? Oh, man, is that real. I told you, imagine if your partner says, Hi, meet Martha. It's our new one. You're like, what? I don't think so. Oh, come on. It doesn't take away my love for you. <laughs> love is like the sun. It's not a pie that gets to... You're like, no way. I, I think, at least most of us. Rory comes home and says, I meet Bob. Bye, Bob. Or bye, Rory. Or bye, Rory and Bob. Ain't happening in this household. Just doesn't feel right somehow. <laughs> call me unenlightened. Call me not fully actualized. No way, Faye. Uh-uh. Ain't happening. Sorry. Unresolved issues, whatever you want to call it, ain't happening. Okay? Anything you want to add to the basic theory of the person? Basic theory of pathology, basic theory of what heals. Obviously what heals is the relationship, an I, thou, genuine relationship. By the way, there are two main models of all theoretical models of therapy. One is relationally based, and the other is skill acquisition based. And obviously this is a nothing than, other than relationally based model. I studied and I did one internship under, um, he was a supervisor, a guy named Barry Graff. Truly, genuinely, marvelously a humanistic therapist, worked with Carl Rogers, all that stuff. The funny thing is that Di Francesca right before him and she's brilliant, wonderful, MMPI, Rorschach, Randall, all that stuff, very prefrontal cortex, great. And then I'd have Barry. Do you know what Barry's single and only diagnosis? He gave every client, he never called a patient, and you of course don't call him Dr. Graff, you call him Barry. Do you know what the single and only diagnosis he would give every single client, no matter who they were? And he'd put it on the insurance form if they wanted. Human being. That's my only diagnosis I have for you. Human being. You're a human being. So are you. So are you. So are you, 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 and me. I guess you don't want to file his insurance claim. You're not going to get reimbursed. They don't have a diagnosis code for human being. But he meant it. By the way, I'm not saying there's no use for diagnoses and whatever. And DSM-5 is coming out. And we know it's not the last. And I, I get all that. But it's also really useful to think of it of human being. That's your diagnosis. That's a very humanistic way to look. You think a humanist is getting a diagnosis to somebody? You're a human being. What do you like about this model and what don't you like so much? It's okay not to like it. Of course you can have any thought, feeling, fancy reaction. You can hate it. You can think it sucks. It's stupid. It's ridiculous. It's okay. You can love it. Think it's the most wonderful spot. You love it, okay. What do you love about it? Um, it, it fits with my values. I mean, when, when I first um, learned about humanistic theory when I was an undergrad, it resonated with me. It fit, it fit with really what I felt. Yeah. I mean, if you do, it, again, it really is. Remember that, this can sound so tangential, it isn't at all. Remember the chicken in the snow mound? Remember that? You see the chicken, you don't see the snow mound but your brain knows that the unthought known, by the way, that's what play reveals, the unthought known. Well, you have this feeling sense of, mm, I've, this, this shovel, it must be, oh, I know, it's to pick up the chicken poops, so you rationalize it, it's not why it is, but you're drawn to it, you're drawn to things for reasons you don't know, it's because it feels right at some level. It's these unthought knowns. And that's cool. It just feels right to you, it resonates with you. It is a groovy model. It says we're fundamentally, by the way, the fundamental assumption is, of course we're fundamentally good. Lord of the Flies is not their book. 
That is a very psychoanalytic book. And by the way, there's a lot of data, and again, there's some videos that, show, that really fundamentally, if we're feeling psychologically safe and our amygdala is not firing, which, as you know, cuts down empathy and all that, that we really are fundamentally marvelous, as you know, pitching. Mm -hmm. You even take a sociopath, perhaps, maybe, though there's some neuro damage, but in some little moment, I'll never forget walking an old lady across the street. She actually called me Sonny. I was probably 40 at the time. My hair was still dark, so I guess I qualified as Sonny. Excuse me, Sonny, would you help me across the street? And of course, me, I'm always 40 paces behind where I need to be, but okay, I'll stop. Sure, I'd be pleased to. And we're walking across Silverado. I'll never forget it. I thought, boy, the world really looks different. <laughs> this is before I knew 3-5. But I gotta tell you, when I got to the other curb and she said, thank you, there was a part of me like, this is so cool. Remember D4.4? It's the part of a genome that releases dopamine when you do a nice thing for somebody else. It's really cool. It's really cool. It's one of the cures for depression, as you know, is go do nice things. Get outside yourself. Go do something else for the homeless or somebody. So, okay, it's groovy. We're nice, fundamentally good. Fundamentally good. It's very relationally based. By the way, so psychoanalytic is relationally based. Obviously, all the behavioral, cognitive behaviorals are very skill acquisition based. You teach a skill. I think that's also important, by the way. What else? Come on, what do you like, don't like? Let's go. It's likely to have, uh, promote a good therapeutic alliance, a good relationship, good interaction. Yes, if you can resonate. Some will say, is that all? I mean, come on, that's all? That's nice, human being, great diagnosis, but come on, man. So you're gonna have the same, the same treatment for everybody? You're gonna treat a borderline, a schizophrenic, or whatever, the exact same way? I mean, come on, and it's ahistorical. Well, no, you're individualizing treatments so that you're not treating people as, um, as a diagnosis. Yeah, but you're basically doing, I mean, again, man. You stupid slut, man. You're basically doing the same approach. You're sitting there and you're going, uh huh, and you're valuing and validating. And I mean, come on, man. Now, I will say, Carl, yay, Carl, was the first one to really do outcome research. Yeah. He really, the, bog, the Q sort, that's Carl Rogers, still in use. And he did on schizophrenics and said it doesn't work. Not in terms of healing them. It might still be a groovy way to be with them, so it might for a moment not feel so alone in our aloneness. But does it heal them, cure them? Mm, probably not, because there's neurobiological bases. That's right, it's not allowing for the neurobio aspects. It's still a wonderful way to treat somebody though, oh, by the way. But does it heal you? Does it, and as you know, epigenesis and all those other things, things can change, the plasticity, that's really the discovery of the 21st century. So maybe relationships, and, and um, Siegel knows that very well, the relationship changes brain structure but up to a point. He's the first to say, you know, I'm not great at anger. I can acknowledge it, but it's hard for me. And I don't know how fully to incorporate it really into my theory. Like, I like Jung's thing on anger and the shadow and all that. Anyway, what you going to say? potential drawback, I think, about the glory of films. I mean, he won't, he won't give it. I mean, he won't answer her question. He won't, Correct. He's just going to be with her. He's not going to offer her a problem or give her a solution. I mean, give her an answer to her. Correct. It can be incredibly frustrating. I hear it's really frustrating to you. Yeah, so give me a fucking answer. It sounds like it's really, I mean, really makes you mad. In fact, here's the cliche on that. You look, I'm just so down, Doc. Wow, you're feeling really, really down. Yeah, I, I just feel like giving up on everything. Whew, you're so down, you just feel like giving up. I, I see you're looking at the window. Yeah, I'm just. I see you're getting up and, and you're walking towards the window. <laughs> I now see that you're opening the window with a profound sense of both despair and this quirky, strange sense of freedom as you climb out the window and stand on the ledge. I now see you going through the air splat. That's reflection ad surdum. Never mind your responsibility, a tum. But that's kind of the cliche would be. Like, oh my God, all you do is reflect. And, no, it's got to be genuine, so you got to really feel it. But what if that's not enough? I get, I get that you get my despair. 
And maybe I feel a little bit better in not being so alone in my loneliness, but I still stuck to be here. I still feel to totally disconnected to everything. I just want to end it all. This isn't going to take care of it for me. Or the little pumpkin. I get that you're okay with my hating my brother, never mind my mom and dad at times. I'm just not okay with that. Remember I said there's un never mind Godman's right, there's unresolved issues within the relationship. There's unresolvable issues with the self that you just have to live with and learn to have compassion and levity about eventually. And that's hard in this model. The other cliche, you need to get all these stories. So he has this client who comes in and basically says nothing. And so, you know, I guess it's hard for you to talk, whatever, whatever. And eventually call, it's like a Quaker meeting. They just sit quietly. And this lasts for about a year. Come every week, and a couple of years later, supposedly the story goes, Carl's walking down the street, and this guy comes up and says, Carl, Carl. And Carl's like, oh, the guy talks. This is amazing. I just want you to know, you know, this high-powered exec, a bunch of kids and a wife demanding, everybody was demanding something. For me to be able to sit with another human being and feel that the person was really present, really there, really wanted to be there with me, but had no expectations of any sort. That I don't even have to say a word and they'd still be with me. Oh, God, what a sanctity. Bless you. Can I hug you? Sure, I'm a chariot with a soft sweater. Okay? Okay, I'm now going to... Oh, time! Stop fleeing by so fast! I am going to operationalize for you humanistic therapy. This is the bedrock. This is how you hold the guitar. Okay, this is how you hold the guitar. What music you play is totally up to you. But I will tell you, this is the fundamental way to hold the guitar. As I say that, never mind that the pen might not fall. Okay, thank you, gravity. Jimi Hendrix held the guitar totally wrong. World's best electric guitarist by far. Nobody can ever argue with that. And every professional guitarist will always say Jimi Hendrix is the best. He held the guitar wrong. So, okay, Jimmy, you can get away with it. That having been said, here is what you're going to do. And I sat down and I kind of operationalized. I thought, what is it that I, we, Stalic, what are we actually doing? How do I teach this? Your role as therapist, you are a mirror with heart. You are going to mirror with genuine heart what's going on. So what are you going to mirror? You're going to mirror... At least three things. If you're a purist, basically that's all you mirror. You're going to add a fourth thing, and then Volcani and other people also add a fifth thing. This is going to sound so ludicrous. And if you do do it to an adult, which I'm going to have you do in a moment, you're going to go, oh my God, this is bizarre. I feel intruded upon. You reflect motor behavior. What they are actually doing. Motor behavior, that's what you reflect. I see your fingers are moving. I can't even say the word typing if you're a purist, because you might decide it's not that. It might be something else. I mean, just to speak to that, what is this? What is that? What, have you, what is it? Circle. Circle. What else? Oblong sun. What else? Hey. What? A ball. A, a ball. Ball. A what? A line. line. It can be whatever you want it to be. That's the point. During our time together, and everyone think, feel the same thing. It's up to you in here. You decide what reality is. I'm not trying to teach you anything. You decide what reality is. You tell me that's a square. To you, that's a square. It'll be a square. So you're going to mirror back motor behavior, what they're at. And if you're a purist, you won't even say directly. You just kind of say, your fingers are moving as you seem to be looking at me. I mean, it's a little absurd. I'd say it looks like you're typing. Okay? Very simple. You just reflect what the person's doing. Your mouth is moving. Maybe you're chewing gum or something. You do that to an adult. You know the song that comes to mind? Every move you make. Do, 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 do. The stalker's anthem. Thank you, Sting. That's what it feels like. It's like, God, would you stop? Go away. It feels so intrusive. You do just that to a little three-year-old, a little four. If we went over to Thurman right now, and you took the little preschoolers, and they're outside playing, and you just said, oh, you're running around, now you're up on the gym, you're climbing up that thing. All of a sudden, it's like seats to pigeons. You're suddenly going to have 15 kids going, look, look, look at me, look at me, look what I'm doing. You're waving your hands, and you're running around, and racing around, racing around. Just do that. Just do motor reflection. Right? Because we want to be seen. We want to witness. 
Ideation. Oh my God, we've just entered the black box. Ooh, the sacred black box. Speculative. Looks like you're thinking about what I'm saying. I could be wrong, but it seems to me you're thinking about it. I see you're looking at me. It seems to me you're thinking about what I'm saying. That's ideation. It's also about attitudes. It's important for you to learn. It's important for you to understand things. She's not, you're nodding your head. Looks like I, looks like I got it. Ideation is actually big. It's actually all that stuff that has to do with attitudes, beliefs, perceptions. It's huge. It's a guess. I could be wrong. It seems to me, perhaps, maybe. Okay? It's really important. Ideation. What's going to go next that you guys are so well trained in? This is what you reflect. This is the bedrock of therapy. Yes, feelings. Feelings. Nothing more than feelings. I always forget that I have a microphone on me. Oh, my God. Sorry. Yeah, I know. You're kind of smiling, so you're kind of feeling. I know part of you is like, oh, God, you're kind of amused. Here he comes again. He's going to do this thing on me. That's kind of a thought. And it looks like you're probably feeling, I'm not sure exactly how you're feeling about that. Part of you probably feels like a little put on the spot. Like, oh, God, he keeps focusing on me and all that. And the other part's like, oh, it's kind of fun. and See if he gets it right or something. Like that. Now you're shaking your head, so it looks like I got that part right. And that feels good when I get it right. And you're probably, this was probably a little too close. Go away, you're getting too close. And this is maybe a little too far. I'm not sure. Somewhere about here is about good. I'm looking for feedback. Feelings. It's very subtle. Because they're changing all the time. Again, clouds, skies, move. You've got to keep reflecting back what they're feeling. Do that to an adult, unless you're in a really intimate relationship. And it's like, paranoia strikes deep. <laughs> Do you know what song that's from? Do you know? Paranoia strikes deep. Buffalo Springfield. God, what's the title? It was like the anthem for the movement. It'll come to me. Okay? What's the look? It's a great look. You look confused. You're feeling, on the one hand, like, uh, frustrated maybe a little bit. Like, I'm not quite getting it. He's not being clear. Oh, thinking about the song. So now you feel a little disconnect because I totally got you wrong. That rhymed. Okay, you getting this? It seems so simple. It's so hard. Initially, it'll get easier. You obviously, I sent her because she has a little pumpkin. I sent her a video that I did for, uh, as the raw material for an app I'm doing of how to be with little pumpkins up to age about two. And you're affecting motor. You'll see me in that video. I'll send it to you also. I have one of little pumpkins and then I have one with um, a uh, toddler with a much more engaging. That little pumpkin, I didn't even know. It was the second time I met and she was like, four weeks old. There wasn't a lot of action going on. But you can just reflect. I see you're looking. You don't know who I am. I'm a strange person to you. I could do that to the pen. You're, you're feeling me hold you. You probably, oh, that makes you a little nervous. You're up in the air. Now you're feeling better. You're, you're you know, whatever. You can do this to anything. Yeah, that's projective, but that's okay. It doesn't have to be uh, verbal, right? Like your facial expression. Oh, totally. Prosody, prosody, prosody. That's why it has to be genuine. Because they pick up, all, the right brain is going to pick up a lot more than the left. I mean, it's going to be more important to the authenticity of what's going on here. Congruence. Genuine, congruent, unconditional, positive regard. I keep adding words. Okay, motor, ideation, feeling. What's number four? Interpretation. The bedrock of psychodynamic, psychoanalytic models. Interpretation. Tation. From when the above cometh. I mean, again, I can just make up, never mind, pick on you, dear lady, but I can just make up a scene. So kids, you're running in the room. You're looking at that bear. It looks like you're wondering whether it's okay to jump on the bear. It's fine with me. You're jumping on that bear. It looks like it's a lot of fun. Now you're hitting that bear really hard. Wow, are you focusing on that? Now you're kicking it and you're biting at it. Looks like maybe you're feeling a little angry and whatnot. I'm wondering if maybe you're mad at your brother because he got that birthday toy and party and what now. And maybe now you're taking it out on the bear. That's a classic interpretation. From whence all the above cometh. What's the real underlying meaning? Okay. What might be some problems with doing that with a three-year-old or four or five-year-old? They may not be aware of what they're really feeling. If we remember good old Pi Piaget. And you remember the old thing with the water? Conservation of matter. And you take it, and you, even one's longer and one's wider. Even though they see it's exact same water, they'll always say this is more. 
concrete operational thought, concrete operational thought. Do you think you're ready for abstract reasoning like equating this with I'm mad at my brother? Holy schnoly. Especially when you're amygdalated. You give adults, brilliant adults, any of us, when we're in a real amygdalated state and we're, you know, it narrows your field of vision. You think you're able to deal with a lot of abstract reasoning stuff? I don't think so. You know, it doesn't have the hardware for that. It makes no sense to them. What's the usual response if you say something like that? They'll either quickly, immediately stop what they're doing. Of course, the analysts will say, aha, so you must be correct. It was just the wrong time. Maybe, could be wrong. Or they go, no. It's like, what? Rarely have I ever, I don't think it's ever happened. Maybe once in Brooklyn in 1956, kid turns around and goes, oh my God, that's brilliant. I never put that together before. Free, free at last, hallelujah, thank God I'm free at last. I know he didn't say hallelujah, I just added that. I know the quote. I don't think that's how it works. By the way, footnote, Melanie Klein, brilliant, wonderful. Open any page to narrative of child analyst. Analysis, narrative. Any page. The page I open to, there's a drawing of a child and her walking with rain coming down on them. I'm not picking on her. She's brilliant, wonderful, all kinds of things. You know what she said to that child who was about four or five years old? I see you want to pee on me. <laughs> Great look. God, I wish the camera was this way. We should have two cameras. Here looks like, what? Hey, is, it, is there a possibility somewhere in the primal mind? Sure. I'm thinking that kid's thinking, you're one dirty lady, man. You're a nasty old lady. But my mom brings, you, brings me to you, and you're an adult, so whatever thought I'm thinking, that's not near as nasty as yours. I'm good, free at last. I'm feeling psychologically safe because you talk really dirty. I'm talking about, you want to be in my tummy, have my baby, you want me to be your mom, you want to be in my tummy, you want to put your pee pee in me. I mean, she talks very, very primal. You read that, read any page, open it, read the page. If nothing else, I think it's dirtier than what the kid's thinking. The kid feels, this is great, I'm fine. But I'll take the disavowed self. It's not near as dirty as your disavowed self. You avow it. Five, you work with me, you're a tradeologist. You're a tradeologist. You've got to study those traits that are being evinced and the behaviors that are going to be useful when the kid is 30. And if you took a transcript, and you, when you watched me with a little pumpkin, when you saw that video, you, you count the number of times. I'm trying to find some trait this little barely mobile two-week-old is showing that's going to be useful when she's 30 years old. And play is the way they develop those traits, and they show them. So when you reflect, boy, she fell, but she got right back up. Wow, tough stuff, tough enough. That'll serve you well in life, being tough and being able to get right back up. And I believe because it's actually happening, not in the abstract, but in their metaphoric mind, it sinks in. What you tell your kid at three is what they'll say to themselves at 30. So be careful what you say. Think about what you're saying. Find the trait that underlies the behavior you hate. And the kid, I will say that to the parents. Drives you crazy? Well, at least they're spunky. And one of the ones is you put your heart and soul into it. There's several, several there's about 10 traits that kids always show, almost always show in these contexts you can use. And one of them, they put their heart and soul into stuff. Man, they just like dive in. The other, like the one yesterday, oh God, was she laughing and laughing. I said, you have such a wonderful capacity for joy. God, will that serve you well at 30 or any age? That'll serve you so well in life. She's laughing. And she does. They show tremendous ability for joy. That's a wonderful trait. Remember the big seven? Remember this one, like curiosity, attitude of gratitude? Remember that one? I sent you the article, actually. Those kids are showing those traits. Underscore it. Underscore you, you, I know you're going to do this. I'm so excited for you. She's actually going to raise her little pumpkin, Stalakian in all these ways, and your own way. It's not only, it's but adding to it. Look at you. We're both going to go like this. It's going to be so cool. They do it and embrace it. Embrace it. It's right in front of you. Embrace it. Put your mingle aside in a moment and just go, ah, oh, God, nobody's going to push you around. I love that. However, I need that compromising part of you. We'll talk about parts later. That's a whole other thing, not today. Okay, here we go before we end. Oh, time. Oh, I'm so sorry to do this to you. You're partnering up. You're going to do 30 seconds. And it's going to seem like the longest, not so much for you because you've been practicing this, longest 30 seconds of your life. You're going to reflect the motor behavior. Nothing but the motor behavior. I see you're looking at me. I see I'm waiting. your eyes are blinking. That's all you're going to do. Now, for God's sakes, give them something to reflect on. Don't just, don't even blink your eyes. 
do something, move around, you can talk, you can move. All you're reflecting, oh, perfect, is motor behavior. Ready, set, go. Motor behavior, motor behavior. By the way, I'll be making sounds. I mean, stop, switch, switch. Reflector becomes the reflectee. How was it? How was it for you? Talk to us. It was okay? Really? You didn't feel weird and paranoid? Yeah, I must feel very, an adult. It's going to, again, you do this with a little pumpkin, never mind you add the other ones. Boy, we go to Furman's and we do all of these things. Oh, God, you're going to have all the kids around you before, of course, the authorities call the police that this weird person is <laughs> hanging out with all these kids. Okay, now, next level, ideation. Again, think broadly. You can still do motor. I see you're putting that inside there. Maybe it's important for you to be neat and organ orderly and organized. It's about attitude. It's about beliefs, perceptions. It's huge. Do you have a comment or question? I, I found myself doing it with, even with the motor. It's yeah. kind of hard to break it down specifically and make it individual like ones. I think they flow into each other. And they type. That's nicely put. They do. You're right. I'm trying to highlight one layer. It's really hard. They do flow. And again, you as therapists are trained particularly to reflect feelings. You look sad, you look happy, you look mad, whatever. But I'm trying to just practice this. Pra try and practice. It sounds like you're wanting more information. You've really been thinking about this. It's important for you to get to, to be understood and understand. Okay? Because that's, that's ideation. And it sounds like it's frustrating to you that it's not quite enough or that I'm missing the point, the flow of it. That's, that is feelings. Frustration is feelings. The other I add is to the ideation behind the feeling. See, and imagine training kids way early to understand themselves this way, because that's really the point, is to take all this and apply it to the self. Have compassion, understanding, empathy. Remember my four-part protocol? Protocol of how to be in this world with yourself. And you model this from day one or in the... I literally, when my goddaughter was a big belly, I mean, her pumpkin inside was a big belly, I was already, you're comfortable in there, I would guess. You're wondering what the sound is that you're hearing. I'm already, because you're training how to be attuned. Mirror with heart. Okay, ideation, go, 30 seconds. I'm sorry I'm holding you over, but I really want to get through this, and then I'll let you go, because you're probably feeling frustrated, tired. And you can talk if you want. You can draw if you want. You can give them things to reflect on. <laughs> looks like you're thinking, looks like you're thinking deeply, maybe you're trying to present something for him. All right, switch, switch, switch. Okay, I'm rushing you through this because I have more I want you to do before you leave. How was that? Easy or hard? Hard. That was hard. It's, it'll, it'll get easy. There's more material there that's of more interest than just motor, but it's less obvious until you really start training yourself in this, and then it becomes very and easy. And yeah, knowing the person, but you, again, do say, but I'm not sure I could be totally wrong here. I might not drop, but it seems to me perhaps maybe. Okay, now comes an easier one. This is one you're so used to. Feelings, and for God's sake, give me a feeling to reflect on. 
And you can talk, you can draw, you can do a bunch of things. But give them some feeling. But, by the way, one other footnote on attitude. A lot of kids like it's important to them to paint right into the line. That's a good ideation one. It looks like it's important to you to do it just right. And you get frustrated, feeling disappointed, angry when it goes outside the line. Go, feelings, reflect. Okay, come back. Yeah, one feeling every one of you has is you're tired and you want to get going. I can tell you that. I'm sorry. Switch, 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 do feelings. Okay, come back. I'm not even doing 30 seconds. I'm doing 15. I'm not going to make you the, do the other two today. I'm going to do something else. How was that? Easier? Easier. Yeah, feelings are easier. Now somewhere out there, you can see them. Obviously, you blend all these things. You go back, forth, back, forth. <laughs> Interpretation's trickier. We'll do that next time. Tradeologists, please keep track of traits. It's there all the time. Everything you're doing evinces a trait. You're able to sit for hours and listen to this guy who's intensely saying things and seemingly tune in most of the time and stay focused. That's a, that'll serve you, has served you very well in life and will continue to serve you very well in life. Everything you're doing is evincing some kind of trait. Please start being aware of that. Kids are very determined. That's a real classic. I'll say, boy, do you stick to it till you do it? And they like the rhymes of it. <laughs> Rhyming is wonderful. They love funny, weird names and rhymes and all that stuff. And they will remember it. Team, wow, man, you know when to do things on your own. You love to do things on your own, but you also know when to ask for help. That's straight out of the Roberts at Perception test. And the ability to be self-reliant, but also reliant on others is very positive. And those kids, parents said, you know, it's funny. He even said out loud, I can do it by my own, but I also know when to ask for help. They do listen. They do soak it in. Before you go, I've got to tell you this, and this is really hard. It's going to be the singular hardest thing for you to do in this class. I swear to God. And when those little pumpkins come in two weeks, in three weeks, thank you, because you're going to be free, free, free at last. Yes, you are. When those little pumpkins come, as much as you're going to try not to do this, you're going to do this. And then you go, oh, damn, I can't believe it. Oh, damn, I can't believe it. Do you know what that is that you're going to do that I'm going to tell you not to do? Correct a memento. Exactly what I was doing just not now. Do not, do not, do not, do not. Did I mention don't? Ask questions. Don't ask questions. And that is so contra. Talk about templates. Talk about bioreciprocal patterns. Your number one way of relating to kids. Hi, what's your name? How old are you? Where do you go to school? What grade are you in? What subject? Just a barrage of questions. They look up at you and blah, blah, blah. And that's such a... It's overwhelming to them. And by the time they're teenagers... Well, some of them might say, here's the rule. Withdrawn, frankly, with, and this was only specific to a certain content area. He said, folks, you get three questions a day. That's it. Choose wisely. I don't ask him questions. My dear sweet wife asked him a lot of questions. Kids don't want, yeah, mm, they don't want to do that. Why not? Why is it not okay within this model? Again, there are other models. I'm not saying you never ask a question. But within this model, until we are six, and you're doing individual play therapy, being with this child through the medium of play, connecting, bimonic, why do you not ask questions? Please. Maybe because it's more experiential, and that you want to remain in the moment, and that they don't really have that much. You're trying to get them to have insight behind what they're doing, not getting them to answer your questions. I don't know. You're saying a lot in the, what part of the brain are you in when you're playing? And what part of the brain are you in when you ask a question? What are you doing? Oh, yeah. You're getting out of the mind. Exactly. Immediately and assuredly, by definition. 
And if you want to be bimonic, because it's really about connecting, as soon as you ask a question, you're now in the prefrontal cortex. Aren't you? Oh, that's the other thing you're going to do. That part of you that wants to ask a question is so sneaky that even you'll make a comment. I see you're looking at me. Aren't you? It's like, stop. Just leave it at, I see you're looking at me. Oh, you'll even be better than that. I see you're looking at me. <laughs> it's just in your tone. It's like, let it be a statement. It's okay. Now, in fairness, I think part of it is we feel presumptuous. How presumptuous of me to assume I know what you're thinking, feeling, you're right, all that stuff, what you're doing. How presumptuous of me. It's okay. It's not. Don't ask a question. If you're going to ask a question in this kind of model, the only question would be, <coughs> what question would you like to ask me to ask you? Because the other thing that happens in the question is it sets a hierarchy. I am demanding of you to answer my question. So you have two options. Either you try to find an answer, now your amygdala is going to go, probably, by the way, or you're going to be rude and not answer it at all. I'm, so now I have a hierarchy. Imagine this. Imagine you're playing and jamming with somebody. I am going to let you go, I promise. Imagine you're jamming with somebody, and then you suddenly say, what, what, what key is it in? Uh, e. Wait, what, what rift is that? Dude, do you want to play or do you want to talk? Because I'm into really playing music. Or you're dancing. Or you're doing any activity that has this kind of uh, by thou bimonicness, and you suddenly ask a question, it interrupts the flow of what you're doing. It drives you crazy. It kind of challenges you, too. Like you kind of Within this, and again, I'm not saying never ask questions. Get the latency. You'll see me ask questions, blah, blah, Within this contest, you go home. If you have pets, oh, you look so happy to see me. You can tell your tail is wagging. You're jumping up. It looks like you want to go for a walk. I even say the word, and you're jumping up. Animals are fantastic to practice this on. Little pumpkins are fantastic to practice it on. And if you're really daring, look in the mirror and go, boy, you feel really awkward in my reflecting back at you. <laughs> and by the way, if you do in the mirror, I must warn you, your critic will come out immediately. You'll look at whatever your least favorite part of your face or body is. You'll immediately criticize yourself. And then you'll say, I know the critic is here. I, I see you being very self-critical. Ah, I feel sad for you that you have that much of a critic. I'll try to be compassionate towards you about that critic. You know, whatever. You reflect and you practice this. Practice it, practice it, practice it, and it'll become second nature and you will become reflexively reflective. Go! That part of you